Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this lecture by uh, Professor Joshua Mitchell of Georgetown University entitled Looking for Redemption in All the Wrong Places. Tonight's lecture is sponsored by Furman's uh, Tocqueville program. Uh, the Tocqueville program is a program designed to create an intellectual community that investigates the moral and philosophic questions at the heart of political life. And we do this through a whole series of extracurricular groups, uh, classes we sponsor them, and, um, and events like this one. Students, if you're interested in these kinds of questions, we'd really like you to get involved with our work. So please, um, please seek me out and, uh, and, and find ways to join us. Uh, the Tocqueville program is sponsored by Ginny and Sandy McNeil, Beth and Ravenel Curry, the AWC Family Foundation, the HIP Family, Mary and Bill Howes, Linda Gokerson, the Strata uh, Education Net Network, and several other uh, individual donors, alumni, parents, and philanthropic organizations. These uh, individual, generous individual donors and, um, and, and uh, organizations support the Tocqueville program in the belief that genuine liberal education encourages students to become more thoughtful citizens and more dignified human beings. And we are immensely grateful to their support. So uh, this year, our lecture series, this is the final uh, installment of a two-year uh, series of events on what we've been calling the crisis of liberalism. In America and around the world, the liberal political order that has dominated the world since the end of the Second World War has recently faced unprecedented challenges to its legitimacy. And so what we've been thinking about over the course of these last couple of years is what the weaknesses are in the liberal order that has, has made these, these challenges possible. We've been wondering whether liberalism is dying. We've been wondering what it would take for liberalism to recover. And uh, we're very glad to have Joshua Mitchell with us tonight to speak to these questions of what the crisis of liberalism is and how we might recover from it. Uh, the, this event uh, is part of uh, Furman's Cultural Life Program. This program provides opportunities for students to participate in a variety of enriching and challenging cultural experiences. Through these events, students encounter a spectrum of issues, ideas, and artistic expressions from various disciplines and cultures. And it is expected that all participants display respect for the presenters or performers, keep an open mind in the presence of new ideas and opinions, and conduct themselves with civility in, continue, in the continuing discussion of these ideas. So uh, speaking of the discussion of ideas, when we come to toward the, uh, as you have questions during the event, stick up your little yellow Zoom hand and uh, that will create a cue for me by means of which I will, um, I will call on people at the end of the event and you will, uh, you will magically come on screen the, um, and be able to ask your, um, your question of, of Professor Mitchell face-to-face. Uh, -face. So, um, so use your Zoom hand the, um, when you get a, uh, when you have a question. So uh, let me just uh, briefly introduce our speaker and then we will get underway. Joshua Mitchell is a professor of political theory at Georgetown University. He has served as uh, the chairman of the government department at Georgetown and has been associate dean of faculty affairs at the School of Foreign Service in Qatar. Uh, during the 28 through 2020, 2010 academic years, uh, Professor Mitchell served as acting chancellor of the American University of Iraq uh, at Suleimani. He is the author of some five books, Not by Reason Alone, Religion, History, and Identity in Early Modern Thought, The Fragility of Freedom, Tocqueville on Religion, Democracy, and the American Future, Plato's Fable on the Mortal Condition in Shadowy Times, and Tocqueville in Arabia, Dilemmas in a Democratic Age. Uh, Professor Mitchell's latest book, the one from which his uh, lecture today will, will draw, is called American Awakening, Identity, Politics, and Other Afflictions of Our Time. In this book, he offers a powerful warning about the direction in which we are headed and a challenge to all of us to recover what he calls the politics of liberal competence. And we thought this a, a very fine way to conclude our series on uh, on the crisis of liberalism. Uh, Professor Mitchell got his um, his BA in general studies from the University of Michigan, his MA in sociology from the University of Washington, and his MA and PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. So we're very honored to have this this distinguished the um, uh, scholar and uh, and teacher with us today. Uh, Professor Mitchell, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Professor Story. <clears throat> uh, welcome, everybody. I'm looking forward to our conversation afterwards. 
What I'd like to do for the next 30 or 40 minutes, perhaps 45, is to talk about the most recent book I've written called American Awakening. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the cover art, it's a picture of Adam and Eve being booted out of the Garden of Eden. Um, <clears throat> we've of course had several American Awakenings in our history. Uh, the first Great Awakening happened around the 1740s and Jonathan Edwards' speech or sermon rather, Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God is emblematic of that. What I'm suggesting, um, certainly in the first third of the book, is that we're now enduring another American awakening, a new one, but this time without God and without forgiveness. <clears throat> and what I'm suggesting in the book is that we have to awaken from this, we'll call it faux Christianity, some derivation of Christianity that is identity politics. But then that's not the end of it. I think we also have to awaken from two other afflictions, which I call bipolarity and addiction. And of course, you know, these are, these are terms owned by the medical establishment. But what I've sought to do on the basis of my training in the history of Western ideas is to show that these ideas actually, long before they become uh, attributes of the, the mind or the brain uh, treatable by medical science, these are understood in deep sociological and philosophical ways. And so I've sought uh, in the second and third portions of the book to treat these issues uh, in, in the deep philosophical ways in which they have been treated, because while it may be the case that the portion of the book concerned with identity politics is uh, the most challenging, I actually think that even if we were to get past identity politics, we would have these two immense problems in front of us. Uh, and my view is that unless we address all of these problems, we're not going to return to the world of, of liberal competence, as I call it, which is what, where I think we should be. So what am I really doing here? You know, an author writes a book and, and later on discovers perhaps they didn't fully understand what they were doing, uh, that new understandings emerged that weren't really there or were latent when writing the book. And so what I've concluded a year after writing it is that really what I'm doing is I'm studying three different relationships. Uh, in identity politics, I'm concerned with the relationship between the transgressor and the innocent victim. Uh, and that is the essence of identity politics. And I'll talk about that a bit. Uh, in, in, uh, in the section on bipolarity, I'm talking about the relationship, the necessary relationship between the highs and lows uh, of what could be called social bipolarity that Tocqueville was such a good diagnostician of. And then the third relationship is what I call uh, the relationship between supplements and substitutes um, that's playing out right before our eyes in so many seemingly unrelated domains. So for example, uh, this fixation on drinking from water bottles, uh, our growing addiction to fast food, declining uh, birth rates uh, within marriage, social media, online shopping, our fixation on Google Maps, the dream of supplanting analog life with the digital world, the state usurping the place of mediating institutions, the dream of driverless cars, the attempt to erase national sovereignty, and even the dream that fiat currency can replace money, all of these which seem to be utterly unrelated are in my view instances in which a supplement has become a substitute. And this is a profound pathology. And what I've tried to do in the third portion of the book is to draw all these things together and suggest what we must do to face them. I guess the question you could pose is why would I proceed in this way? Why would I talk about relationships, these three different relationships? And I confess as a political theorist to a certain kind of fatigue that has set in, uh, in uh, that, that pertains to the old fault lines between the left and the right. The left believing in the infinite malleability of man and society, that historical development confirms that all things are possible uh, anything that exists is, is merely a relationship of power. And in the right, in turn, believing that nature, or rather human nature, gives us all the guidance that we need. So in short, the great debate between left and right over these, well, since the French Revolution, I would say, has been between nature and history. Should we understand the human circumstances being linked to a distinct human nature? Or should we say that historically contingent developments make all things possible? This is the great debate. 
And, and I have sought, instead of thinking in terms of nature and history, to proceed by looking at these three relationships instead. So let me talk about identity politics. First, uh, we use the word identity a lot these days. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, we would say, I'm an American, or in my case, I'm a Phoenician because I have relatives who date back to the Phoenician times through Lebanon. Um, but, uh, but we'd never use the word identity. And so, uh, but that's all changed in the last few years. And the question is, what does that mean? So in one sense, when we use the word identity, that's fine because we're simply referring to kind. I'm Lebanese, I'm French, I'm American. And we're just adding word innocuously enough, uh, the word identity. But I don't think that's really what's going on when we use the term identity politics. Or rather, we're using that term identity as kind some of the time, but really we're talking about a relationship most of the time. And we're talking about a relationship between transgression and innocence, and more precisely, a relationship between a transgressor and an innocent victim. And, and also I would add between purity and stain. And as we know from the first Great Awakening, the great concern was how to overcome the problem of human stain and be redeemed and be pure. And my suggestion is, while we're not using theological language at this point or theological mechanism for, for figuring that relationship out, in fact, we are still fixated today on the question of purity and stain. And it's not just in our social relations. Even when we talk about clean green energy and dirty fossil fuels, even there, we're fixed on the question of purity and stain. And I sit next to this idea of what I call the politics of innocence, the politics of competence. And one of the things perhaps we can talk about later is that I think in the politics of competence, you recognize that we're never gonna have a pure world, that we have to work with the partially clean, partially dirty world that we, that we live in, we will never have perfection. And that's the world I think we've lost sight of, which has immobilized our liberal democracy in America right now. The only question before us now is who is pure and who is stained. And you cannot build a world if that's the concern. So currently, um, as you, I don't have to tell you this, the prime, we have what could be called the prime transgressor. And the prime transgressor at the moment is the, is the white heterosexual male. But let me make two immediate points about this. I have no interest whatsoever in defending racialism of any sort. Uh, second, um, my argument is that in the current configuration of identity politics, or rather the very structure of identity politics requires that, that you must have a scapegoat who you can purge. You must have a scapegoat who you can purge. And once that scapegoat has been purged, you are going to need another scapegoat. So once the white heterosexual male has been humiliated and silenced and purged and scapegoated, you are going to need another one. And I see the, the outlines of this already emerging. I think if you go online and you start looking into the Karen meme, you have the beginnings of, of uh, an attack on the next group, which are probably the, the white heterosexual woman and I think that will then be followed by the black heterosexual male. And all this to say that if you think you are safe, if you think you, I, I mean you, the listener, is, has a safe identity category, I'm one of the innocent victims, I'm here to tell you that this never ends well, that the, an innocent victim one day will be a tri prime transgressor another day. And let me just give you an example of this. We are so good at calling out the impure ones uh, in declaring that we are innocent these days. But let us imagine the situation which is already beginning to emerge, namely that we are polluting the microplat, we are polluting our environment with microplastics from our, from our uh, clothing and other plastics that we're using. We're, we are literally destroying the biosphere through microplastic use. Imagine 50 years from now, all of us who've declared that we're innocent and those people of the prime transgressors, imagine two generations from now, young people looking back with the same idea of purity and stain and saying, couldn't they see what we now know? 
that, that microplastics are polluting the environment. These people must be purged. These people were the transgressors that destroyed the ecosystem. This is how this works, is that you're never going to be in a permanent innocent position. You're always gonna need new groups to purge. And I, what I wanna do at some point is discuss Christianity because the Christian claim of which this is a derivative is that there was one sufficient scapegoat who through one sacrifice took away all the sins of the world and it was not necessary to purge another group again. He was the one sufficient scapegoat. That's a theological transcendent understanding of the scapegoat who takes away the sins of the world. Identity politics is not a transcendent scheme. It's an imminent scheme, a scheme in time. And what that means is once you actually do purge the victim, uh, then you have to go find another one. This is what frightens me among other things about transgression. So how did these categories, which are theological categories, become political categories? And I think there's two answers here. The more immediate one that happened in America was the collapse of the mainline churches, mostly the mainline churches. Uh, it, it, I think I, to put this matter as, as straightforwardly as I can, I do see this largely as a Protestant problem, just as I see progressivism as largely a Protestant problem. Uh, so uh, what happened in the Protestant churches, and I think to a lesser extent, the Catholic churches, uh, is that the idea of original sin was lost. Some of you might know that probably the greatest 20th century American political theologian in the Protestant circle was uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. And it, it, his entire life was dedicated to trying to save the idea of original sin in the Protestant churches. And toward the end of his life, he said, I've tried this in everything that I've written and I have failed. And so what he could see in, is in the mid sixties already was that the Protestant churches were faltering, that to put it in slightly different terms, that God of judgment had been supplanted by the God of love and nobody wanted to talk about judgment, sin or stain anymore. And I think even in the Catholic churches, the, the push away, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> from the notion of deep and abiding guilt uh, and, and the softening of the Catholic message in part to accommodate itself to the world, which is what the churches always do, both Protestant and Catholic. I think this in, in some way was responsible too. So I think the, the view in the churches was, well, we don't need to talk about sin and stain anymore, but it turns out that people actually did. There's a deep need in the human soul to try to get straight. What, what is transgression? What is innocence? How do I move from one to the other? And if the churches were not gonna provide a kind of economy, according to which one could understand the relationship between transgression and innocence, by God, politics would. And I think that is exactly what's happened is that identity politics is the outworking of the categories of purity and stain, innocence and transgression into a political realm away entirely from the theological realm. And so where the Pew polls now show that a vast number of Americans are among the nuns, who don't attend church. My view is the Pew poll has been asking the wrong questions and looking in the wrong places. America is religious as it ever has been, except the religion now takes the form of trying to work through who is pure and who is stained in the political sphere in identity politics. So we're never going to escape the problem of purity and stain if the churches don't pick it up fully and use the full resources of the church to address it, which then would include not only transgression and stain, but atonement repentance and forgiveness. If the churches don't pick that up, then we're gonna be stuck for quite some time, I suspect, with identity politics world in which we're constantly looking for groups to scapegoat, constantly looking for ways in which we can become pure. So that's the more immediate American problem, but there's actually a, lot, a deeper problem that goes back much longer. And I think Nietzsche, who I, I both uh, uh, have immense respect for and finally think he's uh, terribly dangerous, uh, Nietzsche saw this in the 1880s. In one of his books called The Genealogy of Morals, he writes the following, it is the church and not its poison that offends us. Now, who's the us? What he means by this is people who've moved from a religious world to a so-called secular world. And his view was, this was a great illusion that in point of fact, the so-called secular enlightened West had taken the categories from Christianity, equality, dignity, uh, democracy even, had taken those categories and transposed them into a philosophical framework 
And so they had thought they had liberated themselves from Christianity and even mocked Christianity. But in fact, they had taken the moral trappings of Christianity, but not the religion itself. The Enlightenment thought that it could hang on to Christian morality, but not Christian religion. And Nietzsche says that's simply not possible. So what, what Nietzsche is alerting us to is that we will for several centuries go through this period in the West where we think we've left Christianity behind. Fewer and fewer people will attend the churches, but our religion, so to speak, has moved outward. And the primary category, in my view, that has uh, migrated from theology to politics is the category of transgression and innocence. Everywhere we look, people are trying to identify who the most recent innocent victim is, just how bad the transgressors are. And the hope is by purging the transgressors and all that the transgressors have done, global capitalism, the nation state, uh, the mediating institutions, fossil fuels. If we can just get rid of all those things that the tri prime transgressor has, has perpetrated on us, then we can have a pure world. It looks to me like so many of the action items of the Democratic Party are in fact of this sort. And I think this is terribly uh, dangerous for politics. And as somebody who came out of the Democratic Party, I, I guess it would be safe to say, I want my Democratic Party back. Um, so the larger framework, this, the more immediate framework is the collapse of the mainline churches, but the larger framework is what is happening in the West. You don't get a secular world when Christianity disappears. You get fragments of Christianity, which then become incoherent and dangerous. And my argument is that that is what identity politics is right now. So let's step back for a minute. Let me ask the question, what is the Christian understanding of stain, transgression, and innocence? And as I said to you before, uh, when I cited Jonathan Edwards and the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God, the Christian does believe that man is irredeemably stained, or rather, without the intervention of God, man's stain could not have been fixed. Uh, and, and this accords in a, in a funny way with the claim that there are, there are a group of irredeemables in the world, which is what identity politics claims. But the problem of sin in Christianity is a thousand times deeper, I think, than identity politics recognizes. The, the illusion, the superficiality of identity politics is that if we can just purge a group, the stain called sin will disappear. But the Christian claim is that it is original, that is to say it's prior to you becoming a member of this or that group, of you becoming a man, you being a man, a woman, uh, this race or that race, Jew or Gentile. I'm, I'm quoting from, um, from Galatians, by the way, some of you know this passage. Um, this is an extraordinary insight that the Christians have, which is that you can't solve the problem of impurity by purging another group. The problem is so deep within us that it took God himself to come into the world to, to, to fix this problem. I think a classic way in which this shows up is the identity politics claim, which is now uh, circulating uh, ferociously, um, that, uh, that we suffer from microaggressions and unconscious bias. The Christian who knows about Adam's original sin looks at this and says, this is hopelessly superficial. The idea that the problem of microaggressions and unconscious bias is a racial thing that whites have toward blacks is hopelessly superficial because the Christian will say, every single day we must wake up and take a good hard look at the extent to which our pride has gotten in the way. Our pride has elevated ourselves over other people. And it's not, it cannot simply be race. It's every single human being. We have to look at and ask the question, how am I implicated in some injury that they have suffered? That's what the Christian does every single day. And so what I'm saying is that the, the uh, claim about, uh, about uh, microaggressions and unconscious bias is a it's a derivative, it's a shallow derivative of what the Christian should know every single day and declare every single day. So you don't get secularism when Christianity declines. What you get is fragments of Christianity left over and I think we have to recognize this. So the Christian claim is that this problem is so deep that God himself had to come into the world to solve the problem. And it was Christ who was the one sufficient scapegoat. It's not a group, he's the one sufficient scapegoat who for all time takes away the sins. And after his scapegoating, it's, it, is, it is anathema to scapegoat 
another group. We have to be very clear on this. And what this does then, and I think Eugene Rivers has pointed this out in any number of his works, what this does then, it reveals the catastrophe of Christian life since the advent of Christianity. Because if Christianity declares that, that, the, put, that we have to put an end to group scapegoating because the problem of sin is deeper than we even imagine, what that means is that Christians who then go on and scapegoat one group or another group um, are, are profoundly guilty of misunderstanding the treasure that they have. This is why Tocqueville said with great agony, Christianity destroyed slavery. Christians reintroduced slavery into the West. It's an extraordinary statement if you understand what Christianity really finally accomplished, which was the end of scapegoating once and for all. And so when this disappears, what we get is the return of scapegoating. And that's exactly the moment we're living through right now. So identity politics to its credit, I think, knows that transgression and innocence are the central questions, but to its detriment does not understand that there's a deeper theological way of addressing this problem. Uh, but let me add something here. I think conservatives uh, have, have grossly misunderstood identity politics and have no way to speak about it. And I think one of the reasons, well, the reason for this is that con conservatives are, are very good at talking about natural law, very good about talking about tradition, and very good at talking about economics, libertarianism, free marketism, if you will. But, but the question of, of justice, the question of sin and redemption, is now the full purview of the left. And my argument is that the conservatives on the right, especially religious conservatives, have a tin ear. They ought to be engaged in this question about transgression and innocence, but oftentimes conservatives on the right will, will sing, say what they've said now for 30 years, which is religious liberty matters. And I agree that religious liberty does matter. But it seems to me that the battlefront really uh, that we have to engage on, all of us, is whether in fact transgression and innocence can be understood in wholly imminent ways or whether um, transgression and innocence are far more profound uh, than, than, than an imminent understanding and really only return to some understanding of the, the Christian divine scapegoat um, is gonna save us from this problem. We can talk about this in the question and answer uh, problem session. Let me just say very briefly, my view is that if we don't, uh, return to a Christian understanding of transgression and innocence. We ask a certain group of, of citizens, now white heterosexual men, eventually other groups, to bear an irredeemable weight and a burden that cannot be borne. And this will turn them to the alt-right. And, and the true alt-right is, is not Richard Spencer. It's a thousand times deeper than this. The true alt-right comes out of Nietzsche. And, and Nietzsche's argument is that uh, we, do not, we do, not, do not move forward in the world by forgiveness. We move forward by forgetting, and there's a, there are movements both in America and in Europe today which are, which are prepared to do this. They look at colonialism in Europe, they look at the two world wars, they look at the Holocaust. They said, yes, it happened, and we don't care anymore because we're tired of bearing the weight of this un, unbearable weight of guilt. And so the alt-right is coming um, unless we can find some way to think through transgression and innocence. So, um, let me add a paradox here that I think is very important to recognize. Can it really be the case that the civil rights movement, which suppose that the, to use contemporary language, that the heteronormative family and the churches are necessary to heal the wound of slavery. This is what Martin Luther King be believed, ends with the attack on the family and the churches we now witness in the name of, of being inclusive. Are 80% of black Americans who believe in the family and the churches now guilty of thought crimes? The problem with identity politics, as I said to you before, is that a victim one day becomes the transgressor the next. And I don't think we can build a world uh, along these lines. Let me turn now to the problem of, of bipolarity. And I'm gonna give you a Tocquevillian account. Some of you know, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote the great book, Democracy in America. I strongly urge that every family have a copy. It's an extraordinary book. Uh, in 1989, I sat down after getting my PhD uh, in, in a library and I opened up uh, the author's preface. It's 11 pages long. I spent three hours reading it. I closed the book and I said, <clears throat> I'll spend the rest of my life reading this book. It's that good. Now he has a general theory about, uh, about the movement from what he called the aristocratic age, to the democratic age. 
And that theory was that you have to you have to have the mediational layer of a society intact. So in the aristocratic age, you had the king, the nobles, and, and the many, the serfs. And in the democratic age, you have the state and you've got citizens, but you have nothing in the middle. And you have to actively construct that thing that's in the middle. And you have to fill it out with what we call mediating institutions. And those mediating institutions are family, our churches, our local civic associations, and I think he would include local politics. These are the institutions that are necessary. Through them, we build competence. We build citizens who are capable of taking full advantage of the opportunities that are presented to them. And without those mediating institutions, as we know, um, young people grow up hobbled and in a certain disadvantage. So we wanna do everything we can to buttress the mediating institutions in society. Um, we, uh, we learn how to rule and to be ruled in very gentle ways. We learn when we should speak up, when we should not. We learn about what he called self-interest rightly understood, by which he mean that kind of self-interest form, not in lonely isolation, which is the great threat to American democracy, but in and through our relations with others, through the, the immense compromises we make over the years, which finally constitute us as a kind of social being that we need to be in order to live well. Um, we also, uh, we also um, need to have these mediating institutions uh, in order to overcome the problem of bipolarity. What do I mean? So Tocqueville's view of bipolarity is this. Uh, he thought that precisely because we move from a world where we're linked and tied together under aristocracy to a world in which we're delinked and alone, what would happen was in his words, we would come to think of ourselves as greater than kings and less than men, both at the same time. And this describes, of course, what we call bipolarity and manic, manic depression. We feel this incredible high at one moment and this incredible low at another moment. And Tocqueville thinks there's a sociological, not a medical cause. While you might take medicines in order to address the symptoms, the disease is actually deeper than what's happening in your brain on Tocqueville's view. The disease is a problem of loneliness and isolation. And let me explain how loneliness and isolation give rise to, to both, or rather the delinkage gives rise to both the, the manicness and the despair. So when you're delinked and alone, you're able to think of yourself as the sovereign self, as selfie man. And Facebook exacerbates this problem immensely because whenever somebody says something that you don't like, you simply defriend them. And so you're a sovereign in your own domain of your Facebook universe. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, this delinkage makes us feel terribly empty and small. And what Tocqueville thought therefore was the delinkage um, was responsible for this bipolar condition that was going to happen. And he thought that the only way that we could uh, ameliorate this was through ongoing face-to-face -face associations in this mediational space. He literally predicted that we would come to a, a stage in human history, which I call management society and selfie man, in which for the smallest problems, we would say, we're not up to it. We have to hand it over to the global managers. And yet we would also declare that we're going to change the world on our Facebook pages and stand up for all these social causes, but do nothing about them because, well, these problems are really too big. They're systemic, to use the latest word. In other words, if, if there's a racial wound in America, it's really too big, it's systemic. Only the state can solve this. There's nothing I can do. And this is, I think, a huge problem that Tocqueville thought that when you've got these citizens who oscillate back and forth between, between thinking themselves they're above it all and they're below it all, then you're not gonna build a world uh, in this mediational space and these face-to-face -face relations that are so necessary to build what I call liberal competence. It's only in these face-to-face -face relations that we can attenuate the problem of bipolarity. And so while I do think identity politics is an immense obstacle that stands in the way of returning to liberal competence, I also think this bipolarity problem is a huge one as well. Let me add one more thing before I turn to, uh, to my rendition of the problem of addiction. One of the difficulties with identity politics is that when you're enthralled by it, you make a declaration, I am this, and you must respect me. And the supposition of that 
well, there's several of them. One is that we really don't need others in order to live. We can simply make our declarations about who we are and then go, go to sleep at night being content. But the other portion of this, which is related to the first, is that we presume that we know who we are. And the Tocquevillian view is the lonely, isolated person does not yet know who they are. And it's only by building a world together in these mediating institutions that we come to discover who we are. And so, so when identity politics declares, well, I am this, and this is the precondition for our meeting, Tocqueville would say, you don't know who you are. And you're gonna only figure out who you are, or begin to figure out who you are through engaging with all sorts of people, some who you like and some who you will not like. And that's the only way that we can attenuate the vicious polarization that's happening in our society today. Now, let me say something about addiction. The way I've treated it uh, is in, in terms of the following phrase, um, supplements becoming substitutes. And here I think there's an ancient idea, several ancient ideas that, that help very much. The, the, first, the idea first appears uh, in Plato's Republic, by the way, in book three and book four, when he's distinguishing two kinds of doctors, the doctors who know the right use of medicines and the doctors who, who know the wrong use of medicine. The one uses medicines as a supplement to return us to health. The other uses medicine as a substitute for health and keeps us in lingering death. It's an extraordinary short little conversation, which I think uh, sets up a, an intellectual framework that, that allows us to think very deeply about these issues. But the framework I wanna use right now, or the reference I wanna use right now is Rousseau, who in the first discourse in 1751, made the following observation. Ancient warriors have courage, modern warriors have strength. Now, what was he saying? He was saying the ancient soldier develop this thing called courage, which is really difficult to develop. Only a few people have it. In order to live well, you have to know what courage is. Now, you can add a weapon to a courageous soldier and he will become immensely more courageous, immensely stronger. And so a weapon as a supplement enhances your strength. What Rousseau thought was that the modern world would seek seek shortcuts. So rather than doing the hard work of developing courage, we would just get more powerful weapons. And he said, while you can win for a time with more powerful weapons, while you can win for a time with strength, in the final analysis, you have to have courage in order to know how to use the weapon well. So in other words, something that works as a supplement will not work as a substitute. This is his great insight. It's also Plato's insight. The more mundane example I think would be um, vitamins and meals. So the meal, self-evident, that's what we have to live on. And you can have vitamins as a supplement to the meal. And that works remarkably well. It can enhance the strength that you have, your vitality, this is great. But you can't live on vitamins. And the problem is we're tempted to live on vitamins because a meal takes time to prepare. But if we can go to the store and get our protein supplements and our vitamins, uh, from VitaCost and live on those, wouldn't it be so much easier? We don't have to spend the time to learn how to prepare a meal. And just as the Rousseau soldier no longer has to learn courage. And, and to come to, I think, Tocqueville's point in mind is that human life really can't bypass the hard work of the meal and of courage. Uh, so, so for example, we, we home is the center and we can go out on supplementary trips. And we used to bring thermoses and, and take our water bottles, but home was the center and the supplement was the trip and living outside of our home. But now we live through our water bottles. We order pizzas to our parks. We don't have homes and we don't have a center. The supplement has become a substitute. Fast food too, think about this. We don't, increasingly our buildings, our homes don't have living or dining rooms in them. We don't have a, a meal plan, so to speak. Instead, we're living, on these supplements called fast food. And fast food can be a supplement to the meal, but it's not the meal. Uh, and I think what shows this most exquisitely are, are the following two things, Facebook friends and online shopping. I want you to think about the terms, Facebook friends. So the meal is friendship and it takes an incredible amount of time and connoisseurship to develop friendship. Now, if you know what friendship is, Facebook can be a wonderful supplement 
you can have discussions with friends who are not with you, but you have all that vast reservoir of invisible knowledge about what friendship is. And it can be enhanced through the supplement, just as vitamins can enhance the meal. But what happens if we decide that's hard work and we rather would rather uh, simply collect Facebook friends? And there what's happened is that the supplement has been turned into a substitute. And just as with drug addiction, you can live for a time on the high of the drug addiction. You finally have to come down to the embodied life of your meal and, your, and, and every, everything else you're really supposed to do for which the drug was supposed to be a supplement to make you feel better for a time. So we always have to return to the meal. And the problem is that we're all taking shortcuts. We're turning supplements into substitutes. It is not by accident that Amazon is one of the largest, Amazon and Facebook are among the largest companies in the world online shopping. Shopping is a connoisseurship. It's an art. You can't simply do it by, by, by surveying a list of possible products. Now you can do it if you know what you're looking for. If you know how to shop, then you can use Amazon well. But what happens if Amazon becomes not a supplement to shopping, but rather a substitute for it? We find a cheap shortcut we lose the art of connoisseurship, and then Amazon has to make recommendations for us because we have incompetence with respect to shopping. Is this really the world we want to develop? A world of utter incompetence because we've turned, we've turned away from supplementary understandings to substitutionary understandings. Here's another one, Google Maps. Okay. When we were growing up, yes, I know, I, I'm going to sound like a very old person here. When we were growing up, we, we literally had maps and had to, had to learn how to read maps. But now if Google decides to turn off Google Maps, millions of Americans will sit in their driveway and do nothing. They will not know how, they will not have the competence of map reading to leave their front porch. Also, uh, uh, think about uh, the, along these lines, the dream of the driverless car. I am all for having drivers who have competence occasionally needing a driverless car. But imagine a world where we use the driverless car as a substitute for developing driver competence. There too, if big brother decides he doesn't like you, there will be no delivery of a driverless car and you will sit on your front porch and starve to death. Is this really the world that we want, a world without competence. But this is exactly what happens when we look for cheap shortcuts. Here's another couple of them, just for your, for your uh, entertainment. Uh, the move to having the state solve our problems rather than mediating institutions. So the state can be a supplement to our mediating institutions. And Martin Luther King made exactly this argument. He argued that the family and the churches need to be intact and the state needed to step in as a supplement to address the problems of, of the civil rights era. It was never for the state acting as a substitute for those mediating institutions. And so we look for a cheap shortcut. Yes, life in these mediating institutions is difficult and messy and coarse and full of ugliness. Yes, it is. But that doesn't mean we give up on them. It means the state may have to step in from time to time, but the cheap shortcut will, will not get us to democratic liberty. The cheap shortcut further uh, eliminates our ability to develop the competence we need to live with one another in our families and in our communities. So again, substitutism is the de deliberate destruction uh, in the name of efficiency of the competences we need. Here's another one. The state can, uh, the international law can be a supplement to national sovereignty, but it cannot be a substitute for it. So globalism is mistaken because it thinks we can have a global political order as a substitute for a national political order. Here's another one. Uh, mercy is a supplement to justice, but not a substitute for it. So in the matter of our national borders, we must have intact borders. There is a category called illegal alien. However, unlike those who simply want to lock down the borders, we must admit that mercy is relevant. And so within the confines of the justice of borders, we must offer mercy to people who are coming from hardship situations. Mercy is demanded not as a substitute for justice or supplement for, 
for, uh, yeah, for, for border control, but as a supplement to it. And so everywhere we look, we have this terrible, terrible problem of turning supplements into substitutes. One more that I'm profoundly worried about, and that is the attempt to make digital a substitute for analog everyday life. And so, uh, for example, some of you have heard about this, the Navy in its attempt to, uh, all the military services and the intelligence services in their attempt to uh, keep up with China's digital move is moving everything digital. And so rather than develop say uh, sailor competence to steer ships, everything is now digitally controlled by computers. Several years ago, there were crashes in the Pacific of three, two or three ships and it turned out the computers had gone awry and there was nobody on the ship who knew how to steer them and they crashed into a coral reef. We have to think deeply about this problem of turning supplements into substitutes. It's a shortcut. And what, I've, what I try to say at the end of the book is that we have to do the hard work of li living, of figuring out how to make a meal, of developing friendship, of knowing what shopping is, of knowing the competence of driving, of knowing citizen competence rather than looking for cheap shortcuts. So we have to awaken from turning supplements into substitutes. We have to awaken from this bipolar condition which is making nobody happy. And I think finally we have to awaken from this identity politics which is a false understanding of transgression and innocence. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mitchell. Let me, um, we've got a number of questions in the, uh, in the queue here. I'm gonna begin with, um, with Evan Huck. Um, here he comes. Mr. Huck, you should appear on the screen here in a second. So go ahead and, and turn on your video and your, and, your, and your mic if you would. Uh, hello. How are you? Hi, Mr. Huck. I'm doing well. So uh, my question is about, it, you said it early, it was about um, like um, identity and groups. And uh, I've seen that love tends to be on the individual, but hate can be with groups. But it seems as if we have a collectivized identity and a person isn't greater than the sum total of the parts, they are the sum total of their parts now, which kind of goes into intersectionality. And my question is that like, well, like, what are your thoughts on that? And is this, is this like, do you see it as an attempt of like finding power structures, attacking groups because it's easier than attacking individuals or just, just like your thoughts on that? Well, so uh, I'm, I'm very nervous about identifying ourselves as groups for starters. Uh, I, I don't think it's fine grained enough. I think if, we, if we're trying to build a regime that is committed to respecting the individual I think we should do everything we can to move away from groups. Let me take up the intersectionality issue which you raised. Uh, and I'm gonna do it in a funny way. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about what happened in the Reagan era in the 1980s. And what was interesting there, and I, I lived through it and was peripherally involved in it. Uh, what happened was there was a hope during the Reagan years, the Republican president, that we could find a way to think about human life that had a kind of calculable outcome. So what Reagan was known for was pushing up what was called the market theory of social order or the idea that economic efficiency trumps everything. So we're looking to come to my point to a measure that we could use to evaluate human life, a fixed measure that we could use. And that measure was money. And I think what's very interesting about this is we're now at a moment where we're trying to find a measure too. It's your intersectionality score. And you can go and find what your inter intersectionality score is depending upon how many innocence categories you can check. And, and I see this as the twin of the Reagan attempt uh, to use money as a single measure. The need to find a measure by which we can comfortably engage with other people and build a society. And uh, I'm, I'm enough of a Tocquevillian to believe that this is actually a very, very dangerous thing. So both intersectionality and, and the pure free market theory of social order are equally pernicious because in my view, and really it's Tocqueville's view, 
we, we don't know what the measure of ourselves are and we don't know what the measure of the other person is. This is something we have to discover and we discover it by building a world together. And so what I think identity politics does and what intersectionality does is it gives you a way to position yourself with respect to other people. And, and as a Tocquevillian, I don't want that kind of comfort. What I want is the discomfort of face-to-face -face encounters which exceed the categories that we've brought to bear. And, and that's the only way that we can build a world together. Uh, Tocqueville says in one place, I praise democracy not for what it does, but for what it causes to be done. And what he meant by that was what it, what it does is make a mess of things. What it causes to be done is to unleash this extraordinary energy in a society. And, and what that energy really is, is the recognition that through dealing with other people, your world has been made bigger. And so the problem with identity politics is it doesn't want to enlarge the world. It wants to delineate the world and leave it the way it is and perhaps have the state come in and fix systemic problems. And my view is that's a luxury we don't have and it's a luxury we don't want. The, the more difficult thing, the more beautiful thing, the, the, the agonizing thing is to build a world in face-to-face -face associations. Of course, we're gonna come to it with, with our various categories. That's how we always start. Uh, but the goal of human life ought not to be to fortify the categories, but to move beyond them. Mm. And I think only in face-to-face -face encounters can we move beyond them. So I'm as nervous about intersectionality scores and identity scoring as I was back in the 1980s when the conservative Reagan administration thought, well, here's how we're going to treat people in terms of economic efficiency. There too, you're looking for a measure. And I don't think measures are what we need. We need something beyond measure. And by the way, it's grace and forgiveness uh, and, 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 and the miracles of generosity, which are beyond measure. And that's what we need to advance to one another. Thank you. Um, let me get our... Yeah, thank you, Mr. Huck. The, uh, let me get our next questioner, who is Evan Myers. Uh, everybody else, the, uh, remember, uh, just raise your little yellow uh, Zoom hand to ask your questions. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Myers. Hi, Dr. Story. Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mitchell. Really appreciate the talk. Uh, as you may know, uh, Dr. Story and Dr. Mrs. Story recently published a book. Um, and one of the topics in that book is something that struck me as um, somewhat relevant, very relevant to a lot of the things that you were discussing, and that's imminent contentment. Um, this sort of idea that what we're really seeking is this sort of instant gratification. I, I think that has relevance for um, your understanding of addiction, as well as this idea of, yeah. of um, pretty much all of the things you talked about. I guess I was wondering if you've considered something like that or, or where, where is this stuff coming from uh, all of these new understandings well the, the so the, the phrase i use is um the self-satisfaction of man so we're, what we're always looking for is self-satisfaction uh, i trace this frankly to well the great book that i think first lays this out is saint augustine city of god and he distinguishes between the city of man and the city of god and the city of man is, is the attempt to build a world in which we're wholly self-satisfied and, and don't need God. So there's a recognition of, of life pulling in on itself. Let me just invoke Immanuel Kant, who I don't normally invoke, but he saw this too. So he says, the initial condition in which we find ourselves is what he calls the condition of the Arcadian shepherd, the shepherd on the hill, completely contented. And he says, if we're left that way, we're in real trouble. And he says, nature doesn't allow us, nature does not allow us to do that. She forces us into sociality. And so we're forced into a situation where we both need people and want to build a self-aggrandized world around ourselves. So this is what I call selfie man as well. So Kant saw that there's this tendency for the self to collapse in upon itself, but nature wouldn't allow it. And he writes that in the 1780s. Well, Tocqueville comes along in the 1830s and says, what do you mean nature won't allow it? These people the, in the democratic age, they're going to do everything they can to build a world where they don't need each other. And so we are going to be able to collapse into this self-referentiality. And I think identity politics 
I mean, insofar as it's concerned with justice, please don't misunderstand me. Justice is a great question. And, 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 uh, and the issues of transgression and innocence are central questions to human experience. So that's not my critique. My critique is what it does with that. It, it arrives at a place where it says, I am this, and you have to respect me. And while I'm all for respect, uh, because we can't build a world without respect, I think it's a bad idea to start with declarations about who I am, rather than entering into every exchange saying, I, what am I gonna learn here? about myself and about other people. And I think frankly, we'll be much more happy when we do that. So, as, and I, Mr. Myers, you're right. The, the problem is it's like addiction. You, you pull in farther and you think for a minute that you're free from all the problems of life. But in point of fact, there's ample evidence that you're not because there's, there's uh, loneliness, uh, despair. And Tocqueville's view of this is that the only way we can move past this oscillation of self-aggrandizement and despair is to engage with one another and build a world together. Thank you. Okay, Price St. Clair, you're up next. All right. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mitchell. Um, really covered the gamut in that talk. Oh, so it, it was hard for me to like dial in and think about what specific question I wanted to ask, but I kept coming back to this question of why are conservative Christians failing in this moment to deal with the question of transgression and innocence the way that you say that it, it ought to be dealt with. And I, I think I agree with a lot of your account that like small o Orthodox Christianity ought to be able to speak to these things in a deep way. Um, but I think particularly um, with issues of of race is failing to do so. And so like people are, you know, coming up with these categories, things like microaggressions, because the, the church isn't providing yeah. language that, that is su substantive in that area. So I was curious what your thoughts were on that. No, it's a great question. I was just down in Dallas giving a, a lengthy talk about this, that, that it, it's precisely the Christians who ought to be able to say, well, you're onto something here with transgression and innocence but you don't, have, you don't have the full range of understandings of what this could be. So as I've said on another occasion, identity politics is feasting on crumbs, come to the feast. But the, the problem with the churches, and this has happened over the last several centuries, is that they want the God of love, but they don't want the God of judgment. It's the God of judgment who points out that you're broken and you're sinful. Nobody wants that anymore. And, and I think uh, the, 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 the true, here I dare say it, the, the true Christian understanding has to contain both the God of, of, of love and the God of judgment. And maybe some people have gone too far with respect to the God of judgment, and maybe some people have gone too far with respect to the God of love. But right now, within the Catholic and the Protestant churches, it's all about the God of love. God accepts you. God loves you. Uh, and... Uh, Jonathan Edwards would be very troubled by this. And I'm not saying we all have to be Calvinists. Please don't misunderstand me. I think even Catholics have a deep understanding. I mean, the Protestant Catholic split is over the degree to which there's original sin and how we understand it, the, the effect of the fall. But, but we both agree that the problem was so grave that God had to intervene. Mm -hmm. So the churches have utterly failed here. Uh, and and I'm, I, I concluded, I sort of concluded it while writing the book, but now I've really concluded it. There's no political resolution to this problem. The only way this gets fixed is if the churches awaken and, and recover the treasure that they have. Uh, and that's the only way we're gonna put identity, transgression and innocence into their, their proper place so that we can understand how to address our social problems. On the matter of race, if I can, do you mind Professor Story? No, please I, go ahead. Uh, I have, a number of sections in my book on race, um, because I do believe this is the great wound in America and it has to be dealt with. But, but I don't believe that we get there through collective guilt. I believe we get there through collective responsibility. And I don't mean collective responsibility in the sense of putting the Black Lives Matter sign on our front lawn and then absolving ourselves of it. I mean, th th there, there are people who are suffering, black and white in this country. And I think we have a moral obligation to care for the least among us. And, and the way we do this, I think, is rather, 
rather than making broad systemic claims about insurmountable problems that apparently only this only more state funding can fix, which is in my view a travesty. Uh, what we need to do is get very fine grained about this and ask the question who in the communities in which we're living um, is suffering and how can we help them. And that's both black and white. And so Indeed, I, I concede, I agree with much what the left is saying, that there is a collective legacy here, uh, which has to be overcome. But I don't think it can be overcome by bald declarations about transgression and innocence. It can only be solved in face-to-face -face relations where we come to trust one another and help one another through charity. Can, can I follow up on that real quick? Yeah. Um, do you have any sort of advice or input of how churches or other cultural institutions can recover an idea of the God of judgment? Because you, I mean, I, I understand the argument that, you know, there's a problem we sort of lost this idea of a God of judgment and it's only the God of mercy other than sort of recognizing, oh, we kind of need to have both of these. What, what steps might churches or other institutions take to recover that idea? Frankly, I have little faith in almost all the theological seminaries. And my view increasingly is that lay people are going to have to step forward and demand of their religious leaders that they take this more seriously. Uh, and, and that puts you in a very uncomfortable position. But I don't think it's gonna, become, it's gonna come from the established religious institutions, which began a very, very long time ago, 30, 40, 50 years ago, to give up on the idea of original sin. So again, you know, we can disagree, Protestants and Catholics can disagree, but I also see this, and this is something I've not said, but I'm ever in my conversation, but I'm gonna say it here. Uh, you know, the Reformation was a great schism in the West because the Protestants went to a much darker view of original sin and the Catholics decided they weren't gonna go in that direction. I actually see this as maybe a once in a 500 year opportunity for Christianity itself to rethink what, what fault really means here, that we've had a hardened position on the left and the right or rather the Protestants and the Catholics. And this might be an invitation for us to use this, uh, to use this debate and the seeming intransigence of the problem to completely rethink um, how we think about uh, human transgression and innocence so that there might be grounds for rapprochement between Protestants and Catholics. This is the first time I've said this, but I actually believe this. This is an invitation to all of us to think about transgression and innocence in deeper ways than identity politics um, has given us. So let me just tell you a very quick story. So one of my favorite books to teach is The Republic. In the beginning of The Republic, uh, being a book two of The Republic, you've got Glaucon and Arimantes saying to Socrates, in effect, our fathers have betrayed us. They've not told us what justice is. And so we're walking around with shadowy understandings of what justice is. I see identity politics as Glaucon and Arimantes <laughs> screaming out, uh, you've, not, you've not helped us understand transgression and innocence. So this is what we've come up with. <laughs> Wow. Okay, <laughs> that's uh, that's 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 a remarkable comparison. The mention of Glaucon and Adamantus and the site of Price St. Clair and Evan Myers the um, prompts the following uh, question for me. The um, uh, there are some uh, politically ambitious young people on this call right now. You deal with politically ambitious young people at Georgetown all the time. For those who who have those kinds of ambitions, what's what's the kind of what does liberal competence look like for them? Uh, I, mean, I, I can give a, a kind of abstract argument, but I think we have to discover this by doing. Mm -hmm. And the obstacles to this, I think, are, are identity politics, because what identity politics has done is completely distorted our field of view and our understanding of the actions that are required of us. So I say in the book that what identity politics does has, what identity politics has done is throw us all into this condition where we're, we're involved in what I call the Passover ritual. And remember the Passover ritual is where God says to the Jews, paint the blood of innocence on your lintel and death will pass over you. And, and what I'm suggesting here is that rather than sitting down and, and deciding and asking the question, what can I do tomorrow to build a world together? That's not what we're doing. All of our energies are going into asking the question, what is the innocent signal that I have to send in order for social death not to kill me? And, and I, I've say, said to conservatives, it is 
It is not correct to use the word vir virtue signaling. We use this word. Virtue is a Greek good. Innocence and transgression are Hebrew and Christian. And what we're involved in here has nothing to do with Greek virtue. It has to do with innocent signaling and the immense energy people are expending uh, by, trying to sh by trying to deflect social death from them. And so we're living in this absolute dream world where we think we don't have to build a world of liberal competence. We can get away with simply innocent signaling. And I, I've used the Black Lives Matter sign uh, as an example, and, and please do not misunderstand me. I spend a fair amount of my time working with Bob Woodson of the Woodson Center, and you can go look it up, or 1776 Unites, which is a group that happened, emerged in the aftermath of the 1619 Project. I mean, very concerned with how, how we can directly redress the wounds of the legacy of slavery. So when I say I'm uh, nervous about or opposed to Black Lives Matter, sign, it's because they're used as innocent signals so that social death can pass you by and so that you have to do nothing. And, and I'm, my sense is we have, look around you, we have these immense problems and we're not gonna solve them by saying, you're this, you're a transgressor, I'm an innocent victim. We're not gonna solve them. And the beauty of American democracy is that we've stumbled along not really with a plan. Uh, this is why Han Solo in, in uh, uh, Star Wars is so interesting. He said, I, yeah, I, I'll make up a plan as I go along. That's what Americans do. And so rather than have a plan, I'd rather we all be Han Solo and just kind of stumble into the problems that we have. And instead of thinking about, instead of spending immense energies on, on, on innocent signaling, let's just try and figure out what the problem is we want to solve and go for it. Mm. The, um, let me, if I can allow myself another um, another question or two here. The first is, I think when when we look at the dynamic that you're describing um, with uh, in terms of scapegoating, I think because the focus of our moment is so intense on a particular group as the scapegoat, it it is it, it is hard to believe that the dynamic that you're describing is really going to take place. That is that once uh, straight white guys are purged, we will move on to the next group. Yeah. What, what can you say to make the, what, why are you so confident that this is gonna happen? Well, um, I, I do see uh, young men uh, who feel the burden of this doing much less uh, hiding in some way, uh, and we, we should talk candidly about this, <clears throat> various addictions, uh, pornography, these are really, really serious problems mm -hmm. uh, among a group of people who have been pushed aside. Uh, and, and I don't think that's what liberal pluralism is all about. So uh, I think, I'm not sure we'll get to complete purgation, but I am quite sure that, that we're beginning to see the next groups being picked out. Uh, the Karens, black, black heteronormative men as well. So I think it's gonna be a big issue. But my bigger worry is not so much uh, that, that they get purged, but that they come to a point where they say, I can't bear the weight of irredeemable stain anymore. I mean, the Christian claim is we're all irredeemably stained. That's the bad news, that's the Good Friday, but there's the Easter Sunday. And so Christianity has this twofold understanding of both the irredeemable stain and, and, and the good news. And the gospel means good news. What's the bad news? We are condemned to death by sin. I mean, that's why it's called the gospel. It's the good news that death has been overcome, that irredeemable stain is not the final answer to the human situation. But for identity politics, irredeemable stain for the purged group, for the scapegoat is the final answer. Mm. There's, there is never any way, unless of course, you, you are white and you say that, well, those other white people are the real problems and I'm pure and let me show you my innocence. And this is the guilty white liberal if you want. But that's another issue. So what's gonna happen though is when, uh, what is happening? It's not, what's, I don't have to speculate, it's already happening. Uh, this group of people who are now bearing the weight of this irredeemable sin are beginning to think, well, I don't wanna live this way. And they're finding Nietzsche. And what Nietzsche mm -hmm. gives us is the alt-right. And, and please people, the alt-right is not Richard Spencer. Richard Spencer says, white people aren't guilty, they're innocent. He's still using the language of guilt and innocence. You must understand this 
about Richard Spencer, that has that is pale compared to what the alt-right really is. The alt-right is the abandonment, the repudiation of the very categories of transgression and innocence, and especially the innocent victim, and replacing it with the category of strength and weakness. This is what we must understand about the alt-right. The alt-right is concerned with power and nothing else. And so members of the alt-right say, I, I know these groups in, in Europe, and I don't know any in America, but I know them in Europe, and I'm very worried about the future of Europe here, the near-term future of Europe. What they say is, we're told we've got the irredeemable weight of colonialism, of World War I, of World War II, and the Holocaust. And there's no way, because the churches have been destroyed, there's no way that we can be absolved of this weight. And so what they conclude, and it's very understandable, is they don't care. They, <laughs> they will have a tomorrow, to use Nietzsche's language, by forgetting. Not through forgiveness, as the Christian does. But you will have a tomorrow by forgetting all the infractions. What are my wounds to me? What are, what are my... Uh, what are the, the horrible, what are my cruelties to me? This is Nietzsche. And so you've got a generation of young people, largely white young men at this point, who are saying, we're done. We don't believe in any, we, we don't even want to take any responsibility for anything. And this is actually my biggest weird, fear, because I, I want transgression and innocence, because I think, and Nietzsche got this right too, strangely enough, it's through transgression and innocence that the West became what it was. Why? Because what you will always ask if you're concerned with transgression and innocence is, am I at fault? Am I responsible for something that happened? That is entirely different from a shame honor culture, which is always concerned with saving face, even if you have to lie through your teeth and take no accountability. This is why in the West, corruption and transparency matter. These are the legacies of this Christian view that you should take responsibility for yourself always asking the question, are you guilty? The alt-right will do away with all that. And, and I don't want to do away with this. And so this is why I, I get animated about identity politics. It has no idea what's it inviting. It's inviting a group of people who are irredeemably stained to react and say, we're done with innocence and transgression altogether. And I want to retain the Christian categories. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, Morgan Smith has a question here. I'm bringing her on. Hi, Ms. Smith, if you can turn on camera. Uh, it's, it's, it's near oh, me. Oh, it's near me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, so I, okay. Thank you so much. This has been really, really interesting to listen to. So I was just thinking, I know you've brought up Plato a few times. Um, and with the distinction that you just made between Richard Spencer saying, appealing to guilt and innocence and saying, we're not guilty versus someone who rejects the guilt and innocence category and appeals only to shame and honor, if I'm summarizing your argument right, really reminds me of Calicles and the Gorgias and how he rejects um, natural, sorry, rejects convention and says there's only natural justice, AKA strength and weakness. And so therefore there's really no such thing as undeserved suffering because if you're weak, then you're just pathetic. Yeah. And so, and thinking about the Gorgias, um, like the course of the Gorgias and how I know, oh, um, how like um, recalcitrant Calicles is and it seems like Socrates never reaches him. So I guess I, I would be curious if you agree that Socrates never reaches him, but also um, basically c considering like Calicles' position or any young person, anybody's position being, I reject guilt and innocence as like even something to talk about. And I'm clearly like, my actions are oriented by shame. What do you think is the most effective way to talk to somebody who's dis who's like either displaying or um, trumpeting that? Maybe they're not admitting it, but that's what they're displaying. Do you think that guilt is something like, um, inexorable and like something that everybody has no matter what. And so like, you should still be appealing to guilt even if they're not verbally recognizing that that's, that they have any guilt. Yeah. Or is, guilt, is, shame. Like which one is more an inherent and like inescapable and like you can always talk to it. Does that make sense as a question? Oh, yeah. oh no, it's a, it's a, a very, it's a great question. So <laughs> let me, I'm gonna sh shift from, um, from Calicles to Cephalus in the opening passage of the Republic. So, so in, the, in the first book of the Republic, Plato gives us three definitions of justice. 
The first one is offered by Keflis, and, it, and it's justices paying debts. And so what, mm -hmm. is he guilty? Is he, does, he, does he feel that, that there's, the deep, let me put it this way, the deepest impulse of human life is, uh, is debt and payment. That's why Socrates does that first. And, and the question I think is whether, whether, whether there's, there's a way to get him to change and whether Polymarchus's son can change. The, the problem I think in the, in the Republic there, and it's said there in the first page, how can you persuade us if we will not listen? Now, I think guilt and debt are the deepest things. And I think that's why uh, Socrates gives us that as the first definition of justice. Um, we, feel, we feel like we owe some payment for something, right? And what's the oldest code, what's the oldest written tablet we have? It's the code of Hammurabi, which is a, which is a tablet of, of compensations and expenses because we feel like we owe something. So Sac Socrates gives us Cephalus, who has this, the first opening claim about what justice, I think that's the deepest understanding. So I think guilt is always there. Um, the, the difference between Christianity and, and paganism was that with paganism, you thought you could pay the debt. Okay, Cephalus goes off to attend to the sacrifices to pay his debts. Uh -huh. the, the Christian difference is, no, the problem of, and this is, by the way, worked out in Athanasius on the, on the Incarnation, which is a little book of 120 pages, which saved the, the Christian churches 50 years before Augustine wrote, you must own it on the Incarnation. And, and what he understood was, no, Christianity is different. You can't pay the debt. So Adam and Eve so broke with God that there was no, guilt was so great that God had to send himself into the world. So there's a pagan way to pay off debt. Uh, and, and by the way, purgation, finding an imminent scapegoat who you think once you purge, then we're clear. That's the pagan way of understanding. And the Christian way of understanding is no guilt is so deep that you can't pay it off. God himself had to pay it off. So, so the primordial condition, if I may, is the condition in which we think we can pay our debts. It's the pagan understanding. We can get rid of, we can pay for something, we can get rid of a group, and, and then everything's clear. The deeper one is the Christian one. And that's the one that I think is disappearing and we're returning to the pagan one. Now on the shame culture, look, I was born in Cairo. Uh, my family, my father was with the State Department. I grew up in Yemen and Kuwait. Uh, I went back to Saudi Arabia one summer. I've spent the better part of the last 15 years in the Middle East. So I have something to say about an honor culture. And, and what, is, what is remarkable to me is that when I teach St. Augustine, uh, to my Muslim students in the Middle East, which in Mus Islam is largely an honor culture, not a guilt culture. The, the, pas the passage where they're most haunted, which you and I have probably read in St. Augustine and blasted by and, and thought not another thing of it, is mm -hmm. book one, chapter 20 and 21 on the suicide of Lucretia. <laughs> oh yeah. Now, suicide of Lucretia, it, I'm glad you've read it, you remember it. So what's the issue? So if you're living in a shame culture, Lucretia should kill herself because she was violated. If you're living in a shame culture, right? And what Augustine is announcing is this guilt culture. So original sin is deep. But what happened to her isn't a consequence of her original sin and therefore her will was pure and therefore she was, was innocent. My Middle Eastern students stumble over this because they have no way of handling this guilt culture, they're an honor and shame culture. And I think this plays out in all sorts of ways, just very quickly. When I teach Adam Smith over there, it, just, it seems like I'm going off track, but I'm not. You know, Adam Smith has a theory that market price oscillates around natural price. And when the natural price falls and you've got losses, your business goes out of business. And he, he comments, he makes no comment about that. Just the assumption is bad, bad investment clears, it gets reinvested, you have new successes and new failures. And my Middle Eastern students who are, who are enwrapped by honor culture and shame culture, they say, no, that can't happen. Because a business, if a business goes out of business, then you've got shame. And this mm -hmm. person can't be allowed to fail. So I'm saying this, this distinction between shame and guilt runs very deep in cultures. And Augustine was, was very clear about this. Christianity gives us this guilt culture, which is in a way much more deeper and much more responsive to individ, uh, individual transactions or, and corruptions than is a face-saving culture. And this is frankly, in my view, the great problem of the Middle East right now is it, it does not have a guilt culture and that's fine, that's Christian, but it's not gonna get one either. Mm -hmm. It's just not gonna get one. Mm -hmm. 
do can I follow up? Is that all right? Yeah. Um, this is going to be, this might be an annoying question, but if you could give like a one or two sentence definition of shame, how would you define it? Um, that you're, that it's, that the actions you're going to take are constituted by social relations rather than by internal fault. So that whether you're wrong. Well, it's, it's what you're standing in society. You can't. So the one thing I learned in the Middle East, I already knew it was you cannot shame a person in public. You absolutely cannot make them lose face. Okay. Even if they've done horrible things, you cannot make them do that. So your social standing is what determines how you, how you act to them. And whereas guilt culture is very, very different. You would call out corruption. What we call corruption in the Middle East, they call patronage. These are entirely different cultural understandings. And you know, while I believe ours is better, I, you know, I lived in the Middle East. I know that Islam is a very powerful force and it's going to be there for another thousand years. But, but it's a different kind of culture. It's an honor and shame culture as opposed to a guilt culture. When you're, so Augustine says this in the city of God and it helps you understand what guilt is. He says, we were innocent uh, and, and we didn't deserve that the, that the barbarians came and invaded us. And then he pauses and says, but wait a minute, all of us are in some measure implicated in what befalls us. You would never say that in shame culture. You could never say that. Hmm. So one is interior, interior fault, and the other is face-saving exterior. One is social, one is psychological is another way of putting it. Hmm. Okay. Because saying that would be like doing damage to everyone else because you're saying that they're implicated. So you're shaming them. Uh, well, I'm not sure if I followed exactly what you said. Say it again. Why can't you say that? Why couldn't Augustine say that in a shame culture? Well, you can't, you can't, you can't call out corruption publicly in the Middle East. Okay. Because you're shaming a person. You can't just, so here's, I'll give you another example. <clears throat> what I call Venn diagram governance. So we set up, I set up two universities in the Middle East. We would go when we were setting up these universities, we'd go to the, the authorities and we'd say, can we have your permission to do this? And they would say, yes. So we'd start doing something and then somebody else would come and they would say, well, you don't have permission to do that. We said, well, we went to the right official. And they said, no, you don't understand. Yes, there's that office, but we're the ones that do this. And then we would, okay, okay, fine. So now we'll work with you. And then somebody else would come along. It's Venn diagram governance. Why do you have this multiple and overlapping officiations? And the reason is the first office is run by uncle so-and-so, who's a very prominent member of society and you can't shame him. So you can't say you're running a corrupt institution and we're gonna shut you down or we're gonna give somebody else a chance. You leave it intact. And then you set up a, a, a Venn diagram governance. So somebody else is doing the same function, but we leave it intact. You see the problem? There's no, there's no way to, for a full accounting of failure with shame culture. That's the problem. Uh -huh. It's another way to put this would be failure culture or shame culture. And, and what Adam Smith presumes coming from, you know, Northern Europe, he just presumes that failure is part of the sequence. Failure, success, failure, success, sin, redemption, sin, redemption. It's this, it's a theological outworking into economics is the basis of market economics, which is why you don't have market economics in the Middle East. You don't have the clearing of bad debt. It's a, it's a huge patronage network system. So it, I'm mean, just saying these are different cultures. And the amazing thing about Christianity is it says, even if something has happened to you, even if something has happened to you, and you can point it out, you can say, yes, it's unjust. Even if that's so, you can't simply say I'm innocent because in, in us all, there's still guilt. We're still somehow implicated. And this is, somebody asked earlier, you know, why can't we deal with the God of judgment? It's because of this. It's this terrible situation in which no matter how innocent we are, we have to admit that there's still some guilt there and we can't handle that. We want, we want look, think about the first conversation that happens in the book of Genesis. The first words uttered by Adam and Eve are, the serpent made me do it. And the second word, those are Eve's words. And the first words of Adam's were, the woman who you gave me made mm -hmm. me do it. It's your fault, God. It's this, this perennial temptation This very in the very structure of human life is this disposition to not take fault upon yourself, but to externalize it. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. 
that, and when you do that, you've got a chronicle of what happens. It's called the Old Testament and the New Testament, okay? <laughs> it's one catastrophe after another. And the prop for the Christian, the problem was so deep that, that there's no way that human beings alone could solve it. And so mm -hmm. God had to come in. The problem mm -hmm. is so internal. So the, the, the great temptation is for all of us to be Adam and Eve and to say, well, that's the reason why this happened. It's not me. It, it's somebody else. And the Christian claim is, well, okay, you, you probably went through that hell. That's true. And it's a terrible thing. But you're not free and clear. And that's agonizing to accept. Because there's, can, no, there's no purging because the purging would kill you. Well, you, it, so the Christian says the only scapegoat, the only purging was the divine scapegoat. And right. that's the Christian claim. But the mm -hmm. pagan claim is, well, no, the problem isn't in me. The problem is that other group. If I can just get rid of them, then, then my sense of guilt and stain, which comes back to your first question, how deep is it? My guilt and stain will go away. And the Christian answer is, no, well, you can get rid of white guys. You can get rid of women. You can get rid of the black heteros. You, you can do all of it. You can, get, you, can even, you can even get to the point of transhumanism where you're trying to purge the human species itself, which is where we're going, by the way, transhumanism but the guilt will still be there. And I, I write in my book, I imagine a scenario 300 years from now when group after group after group has been purged and somebody wakes up one night and says, why is my guilt still here? And the Christian answer is because it's inside you. It's, you can't, whatever happens out there, yes, it's terrible, but you can't blame it entirely on, on, on external forces. And in fact, let's me press this the reason why there's such violence in the world is because we're not looking deep within ourselves and seeing our ourselves as the source of the violence. So it's only by looking in that we can begin to diminish the problem of violence going outward. Anyway, it, there's more, obviously. Thanks so much. Okay. Professor Mitchell, I'm gonna, that, that was fantastic. The, um, I'm, I'm very glad that was our, our final exchange. We all face to face with the fact that if I want to understand the origin of the problem, I know where to look. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for spending uh, this time with us and for great. and for offering us this this very sobering morning about about where we're headed. My pleasure. Good luck. Okay, everybody. <laughs> Good luck to you with your important work. All right. Okay. Bye. -bye. All right. Goodbye.